Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, this is a new application cycle, and I'm really excited to be back with GMAT Club conducting this session. Uh, I'd like to know from you as well, which schools you guys are applying to, what this, what you're looking forward to this year. And um, uh, just leave your comments in out here. At the end of this video, give us a like if you like this video. Give us a, don't give me a, a, a dislike as such, but leave some comments in. If you have any questions at the end of it, please write to me. I'll leave my address for you at the end of this presentation. But do interact and let us know what you think about this. So uh, just to tell you a little bit more about me, my name is Vikram Shah. I am the founder of Vikram Shah Consulting. I've been helping clients get admitted to top B schools in 2009. I love what I do. I love working with young talent like you, guys who achieve so much and um, are looking on to really make a difference in the world. And uh, I love being a part of that journey of helping young talent fulfill their dreams as such. So yes, it's an exciting time, new season, and I have a lot to look forward to. And because this is an, uh, uh, first, because we're starting a new season and when I work with young talent, I usually find that there are a lot of mistakes that people make very early on. And the biggest one is people don't really know how to sell themselves. So through this application journey and this cycle, I thought the very first step to start with is the resume, hence today's presentation. So let's just dive straight into it. So uh, can we have the slides? And yes, so today's presentation is all about creating a really strong MBA application. And let me just walk you through a little bit of what I will be doing through the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so, or perhaps even less, less time if we're lucky. So um, I'm going to start by essentially asking you and can you think about what really makes a strong MBA resume? Um, we then we get on to the difference between a job resume and an MBA resume. So you get to really see the differences and you know what to highlight in your story. We then talk about different types of templates that you should use. And I see a lot of different templates being shared with me, even when we are interacting with clients. And from there on, I'm going to go on to help you learn how to construct a resume first from a formatting perspective and secondly, then from a content perspective. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a complete guide on creating a really strong resume. If there's anything that you feel that I've not covered through this session, then just leave a couple of comments for me and I'll try and get back to you or drop me an email. And again, we'll try and get back to you. Um, I can see a lot of uh, comments coming in and great. Um, it's good. I'd like this to be as interactive as possible, and I'll try and address as many of the queries as possible. So let's start. Let me ask you, how important is the resume, especially in the MBA application process? I mean, is it just one of the small components of it, or does it have a lot of weightage? And the reason I ask you this is because it'll help you determine how much time you really want to spend uh, on creating your resume and what stage of the MBA application you should be doing. So I think you should think a little bit about how do admission committees use the resume. And usually, they, they, that's the very first touch point that they will look at. Besides going through your application form, then then look at your resume and the information is clearly visible. And uh, if it's articulate and the resume is clean, it probably catch the eye more and uh, lead them want, and make them want to look at the rest of your application. So it's not that people don't look at each and every component of your application, but it's, it's a starting point. And from an applications pers applicant's perspective as well, I think it's the very first touch point uh, for a candidate. And really, it's a short, concise piece of document which really helps you tell your story and put all your key content in. It'll help you understand what aspects of this of your story you don't want to focus on and what aspects you should focus on. From an interview perspective, it is probably the only document that the interviewer will have. A lot of the time, interviewers don't have access to the application file. They don't have access to your essays or your recommendations as such. They're usually blind interviews. So 
So the only piece of paper that they have, the only information they have about you is on the resume. And that piece of paper is actually what's going to um, structure your conversation over the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, etc. So it's an extremely important part of it. For me, uh, it's the very first th the very first item of the in entire MBA application process that we start we start with. It is the backbone of the entire application. Uh, when you start on the resume, you usually will start with you know putting down all your content, and then we trim and we make sure that the most critical points are there in it. And we're not doing just a data dump, but I'll walk you through this process anyway. So. I'm not going to answer this question. It's just food for thought. It's something that I want you to think about. How much time do you think that interviewers or admission committee members actually spend on a resume? Is it about 30 seconds? Is it a minute? Is it two minutes? Is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Let me know. At the end of this presentation, I will come back to this question and again give you some food for thought. You can leave some comments in out here and we'll see how you're doing. Because that this very question will help you answer how much time you should actually spend on constructing your resume. Okay, so let's go and let's walk, let me walk you through the difference between a job resume and an MBA resume. So they're not exactly the same. And why do I say that? Because when you're applying for a job, you're essentially applying to the very next position or an upgrade from where you currently are. You're not looking into the future five years down the line, 10 years down the line. So the sort of content that you present would be different. You probably highlight skills which are more relevant to, to your job. Whereas in the MBA, what schools are essentially looking at is your leadership potential, your ability to create an impact. They're looking at you in the, into the future, seeing do you have the potential to really lead an organization? And you might find it strange, but you're seeing how would someone understand all of that from your resume, that of this early in your career. But that is essentially what schools are looking for. So it's something to think about, about the sort of content that you will present and what is possibly more acceptable for a job uh, and, uh, resume versus an MBA resume. So for example, in a job resume, people who are possibly going to read your resume are going to be from your industry. They're probably going to be from similar roles as well or roles uh, slightly higher up and they'll understand exactly what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's absolutely okay to use Java. I prefer not to, I prefer to keep even job resume is very simple and easy to understand for any audience, but it's more acceptable for a job resume to use Java. With regards to an MBA resume, you have no idea who's going to read it, what their background is. It could be read by the admissions committee member, it could be read by someone who's very senior, who's been probably been uh, in the industry for about 30 years, someone who's about 60 years old and doesn't even understand the new emerging industries. So you really want to simplify it for your audience so they can clearly understand what you bring to the table, the sort of skills that you bring to the table, the sort of impact that you can create in an organization. And you really want to avoid jargon, you really want to dumb down your, your language and really simplify it. With regards to a job resume, essentially an for that matter, any resume, you only need two sections. Um, the first being experience, second education, and third others. The other section essentially will talk about things that are relevant to the job. So do you have uh, a work permit for that particular country? Do you speak languages which are relevant for that particular country, that particular job? Languages could also be uh, technical languages. So you really need to think about what you want to put in others. For a job resume, perhaps putting in extracurriculars is not that important. For a B-school resume, however, the minimum sections you want to have is experience and education. You can have other sections as well. And I would ask you to use your judgment and put in only sections which sell you. So for example, if you have a lot of community service, Perhaps you want to create a community service section. If you want a lot of awards, you can create an awards and honors section. If you've done a lot of research, you can or published a lot of research papers, you can create a research section. So just by reading the headings in your resume, someone will already know what you bring to the table. And that's important for a B school because in certain applications, for example, 
you don't really have too much uh, place within the application form to talk about extracurricular activities. Yet schools want to know how you're going to be involved on campus, how you're going to add, contribute to their community, how you're going to add value to their community as such. So the resume is a, a place where you can kind of highlight all these skills. Uh, I'm reading some of the comments already, uh, but I'm going to talk about if I find something which is interesting, relevant to a particular stri slide, I'm going to address that right now. Otherwise, I'll come back to them a little later. So that's pretty much the difference between a job resume and an MBA resume. And I think from an MBA resume, when you read your resume, you really want to see, is it communicating leadership? Is it showcasing the sort of impact that you can create to an organization? Or is it too technical? And I think when you start looking at that, you will automatically start getting some direction in which way you want to take your resume. So before we get into content, let me just get something out of the way, which is the first question which most people ask me. What template should I use? How should it look? So we speak, first talk about the visual aspect of it and then come to the more important part, which is the content. Now, if you just do a Google search and just do resume templates, you'll see hundreds of resume templates. In fact, I've just done that and I've taken a screenshot of it and put some up and I'm going to show you some. And you're going to see all sorts of templates like this, right? Uh, forgive me that the font is too small, but the idea is not to go and look at the individual resumes as such, but just to generally get an idea. You see resumes with photographs, you see resumes with uh, uh, a lot of color in them, and what you find is a lot of two, co two column resumes. And there's a problem with that. The, the fact that a two column resume uses a lot of other space, and honestly, on your CV, this is essentially going to be one page. This is premium real estate. You want to be very, very particular and careful about what you put on it. So you don't really want to waste space unnecessarily, right? Um, you will also see perhaps cleaner resumes, two column again, something like this. Uh, you can't really see them um, and, and read the content on them, but the idea is just to look at it from print preview perspective and see is it doing justice. When you look at the resume on the left and if you see that there's a lot of white space below the dates and such you know for me that's a waste of space that could easily be a bullet which is filled up and uh, it showcases your content better or you could use that same space as margins it just looks a little cleaner here we find that the margins are a little uh, less prominent so cv still looks a little busy and heavy when you come to the right side you're seeing a lot of black content as such right and visually it may look great, but when you actually look at the content which you're presenting to a school and talking about the experience, again, it's limited. So these formats for me aren't the most efficient. I perhaps would use something like this for someone who doesn't have a lot of experience or is struggling to create content for the resume. And then if you have a very limited amount of content, perhaps I would use one of these sort of templates. But my preferred choice of template would be something far more boring, more standard, Right, I will come to that. But just to highlight, from the perspective of being efficient with the space that you have on your CV, avoid two columns, avoid the three column resumes, avoid photographs. And you would say, why would, why not have a photograph, especially if you find someone who's reasonably good looking? I think because a photograph can bring in biases. You never know who's going to be looking at your resume. From an application perspective, anyway, your, application, your photograph is anyway in the application form, and you have a choice whether you want to upload it or not. But from a CV perspective, in a lot of places and countries, it's it's a no-no, just because it brings in bias. It can also lead to discrimination. The same thing goes with personal information, such as date of birth, marital status, nationality. In lots of countries, it's just a no-no. It can lead to discrimination. So those are things that you don't want to include in your resume. So avoid that. Now, many of you. Perhaps what I've seen resumes where you have your name and then you have a career summary or a professional summary or a career objective. And for me, that's a no-no. Perhaps you may want to include it in a job resume because they're trying to align what you're doing towards a particular job and you may want to highlight certain interests out there. But I still think it's very restrictive even for a job resume because you have no idea who's going to read your, your, your resume. You perhaps may have applied, say, for a marketing role, but someone might find you more interesting for a strategy role. And just because you showcase an interest in marketing, 
you've restricted yourself and completely rule yourself out from a strategy goal or something that may, which may be more interesting. So I think it's really restrictive and if there's no reason for it, don't put it in. Plus, a lot of people don't do a great job of writing a good career sum summary or career objective as such. So I would just avoid it altogether. And I'd utilize that real estate for other content which will probably sell you better. When it comes to the B school resume, there's really no objective for it. Because anyway, you're going to be writing the SEO in your career objective, etc. So there's no need for this, right? I mean, your entire CV is anyway uh, a summary of all your achievements and of the skills that you bring to the table and sort of impact that you can bring to the table. So there's no real need for this. So I would say avoid it and use the real estate much better. Um, so what template should you use? So general rule, if a school has a template, use it. But use it for that school if it's not the template that I'm recommending. Um, and the reason I say this again is because different schools have different templates. It's not that I agree with all of them, but in some cases you have to. So for example, Carnegie Mellon has a two-page resume and it requires you to have your font size and font size 12. So it's pretty large. And if you're using a traditional resume, it may not be the way you present it. You need a typical one-page uh, CD. The school doesn't really have a template, but they're asking you to follow a particular style. At least that's what they have been doing for the last so many years. So in that case, you must use that rather than use your own judgment and apply your own template. Similarly, a lot of other schools like a Wharton or an MIT have their own templates and I encourage you to use them. So that said, wherever a template is accessible, please use it. Otherwise, just keep it simple. Use a standard CV or, just, or a single page and then right on top, uh, you have your name with your contact details, etc. You're going to use single column. You're not going to use two columns. It's far more efficient. You can't, probably can't see the content of this resume, but you can have a look at the image itself and get an idea of what it is, looks like in print preview. And then you can see some margins all around and some white space around the dates. And that actually kind of makes it clean and attractive. So the guidelines I would give is start with one inch margins all around, top, bottom, uh, top, bottom, and on the sides. And then later you can play with it if you feel your content is not fitting in, or looking too crowded, or uh, it's not being efficient enough. In terms of font, font size uh, 10 is great. Sans serif, which means no curves, no times in Roman, no Garamond, etc. It just makes it cleaner. It's easier to read. Again, unless a school tells you, please use serif fonts only, or preferred fonts are times in Roman or something else, right? But otherwise, sans serif is the best. Arial is a great font, very efficient. You can use something like Libri as well. And I know this is getting a little bit into the nitty gritties, but this is just important. These are the small things which will make a difference to your resume. Uh, when I'm res res reviewing resumes of the initial versions of clients, I find that they tend to highlight a lot of things in bold, trying to highlight everything which is important in the resume. Realize one thing. What we are going to do is you're going to put in a lot of content initially, then remove a lot of it, and only retain the most important stuff. So from that perspective, if you're doing that, automatically what you have in your resume, everything is valuable. Everything is important. So you don't need to go further and highlight certain things. If you feel that you must do it, and though if it's avoidable, I'll encourage you to avoid it. But if you must do it, a couple of things here and there is fine. Because the more black ink you add to your resume, the more busy it's going to look at. And the more busy it looks like, I think you must consider your resume to be like an ad. If you look at any of the classical ads that you see in a newspaper, you're more likely to read ads which have less content and more white space. They're more engaging. They're more attractive. They're more the ones to really pull you in to read the content versus an IPO ad, which is just full of content and legal stuff. No one ever reads that stuff, right? The same thing with your resume. Keep it clean. So avoid extra stuff in bold. It just adds more black ink, it makes it more heavy. Um, when you're looking at the bullets, you want to have ideally every bu bullet fitting one line. There's some people who say, no, it's okay to go into two lines, and that's subjective. That's entirely up to you and how you wish to present your content. Just make it easy to read. 
be consistent with your line spacing, be consistent with your heading, with your font sizes, with your spacing, with your dashes, etc. All your text you want to be left aligned. You don't want anything justified. What happens when you're justified? Um, the spacing in between words isn't even. It's kind of like walking on stairs which aren't even. It's not the easiest to do. Plus, it doesn't look very neat. It may look neat from an when you look at it from far, but when you're actually reading it, it's not the easiest to do. So just make it somewhat easy on someone's eyes. Keep it left aligned. Um, when you're talking about dates, mention the starting month and the ending month for every role. And this is really important. Sometimes I find that someone says, okay, I've been employed from 2019 to 2021. You could have been employed only from December 19 to January 21. But when you're writing, it's suggestive of perhaps January, perhaps September 19 to December 21. And the period that you've been engaged for is completely different. So how would someone know whether you've been engaged for a long time, whether you breaks in your career? So there's no way they would know that, right? So you really want to put that in on your resume, especially because, like I said, a lot of the time your resume only goes out to an interviewer as the only piece of information that they have, and they won't be able to see everything holistically. And lastly, I would say when you're presenting a resume, everything in reverse chronology. So you want to have the most recent content right on top and uh, then work backwards. What we find sometimes is I find Clients putting in, um, or candidates putting in education on top where the most recent experience or the most recent content is the experience. Why would you put education on top? Just because you see more template. And perhaps you need to ask yourself, why is education there on the school CV template? Perhaps it's because someone who's graduating from that school, that's the most recent experience that they have. So that's what they're selling. They're really selling their MBA degree, and that's the reason why they have education on top. So from an applicant's perspective, you want to have education on top, sorry, you want to have experience on top and then education. And go in reverse chronology, even within that particular section. So sometimes, especially when it comes to extracurriculars, I find that people are jumping around all, all the time. They start talking about something which they felt was really important and great that they did, did but it was way back in 2012. Then they come to something more recent, which is in 2020. Then again, they go back to something in 2016. It kind of makes it confusing for the reader. So you want to present your information in a very simple manner. Just be consistent. Go into this chronology. You can't do wrong. Oh, very quick question, and you can put in the comments as well. Which of these three resumes would you read first? A, B, or C? Again, you're just looking at it from a purely visual perspective. Ask yourself which one you're more likely to read. A, which is a lot of content crammed in. B, which is slightly cleaner, but which also has uh, section headings highlighted and going across the page. And sometimes it's people find that it's great that yes, it's uh, uh, it breaks up the sections. It uh, it looks nice, and that's a personal choice. I prefer C like Rhythm K has commented out here, C, purely because it's just cleaner. And I think you just have to understand that people in general, you want to make life easy for them, right? No one likes anything complicated. So you probably go to C, and that's essentially what you're aspiring for. So avoid any extra ink on your resume wherever possible. Okay, so basically reiterating the point, and I cannot reiterate it enough, the more white space you have, the more likely someone's going to read your resume. So there's no point putting so many hours of effort when at the end of it, you're just going to have someone go look at it and say, hey, you know what, let me just go and ask some questions. Okay, common form asking mistakes. Sometimes resumes are too crowded. Let's go back to the slide where we show resume A. Too crowded, though it looks quite neat. The other problem with resume A as well is the font size sometimes so small it may look make your look, resume look very clean and this is what sometimes we'll see candidates do right they say to make the resume look more clean and to have more white space let me reduce the font size so from 10 they go down to a 9 then to an 8 then to a 7 and then they change the font from an aerial to something really small as well and ultimately it's not legible and that kind of beats the whole purpose of the resume 
So yes, you want it to look, it clean, look clean, but you also want to print it out and make sure that's legible. Uh, the other thing, people have dates, no years, sorry, only years, but no months, and kind of makes it confusing. Uh, very difficult for someone to realize how long you've been employed, and they're probably going to ask you all those technical questions um, and those housekeeping questions rather than asking more interesting questions about your experience. And the other thing is not in reverse terminology because it just makes it more confusing for the reader. So if you follow it, then you avoid these common formatting mistakes, you should be in a pretty good place. Now let's get on to content. And this is the most important part. OK. So this is something that I present. I typically ask at the very start of a presentation or start of a training on the resume. What is the purpose of a resume? In this case, we're doing it right now because we're getting into the crux of it, the content part of it, right? So you really need to ask yourself, what is the purpose of a resume in general? And then especially in the MBA application process. And if you come to think of it, the answer is fairly simple. The purpose of a resume is to get you an interview. It's not there to get you a job. It's there to evoke interest in your candidacy and get you that interview call. From the purpose of an in an, within an interview, you really want to focus on productive discussion, on the experience that you want to share. You don't want to be talking about random things or just about life or just about all the other experiences that you've had. So supposing you've, achieved, you've, you've achieved 100 different things in your career. On your resume, you want to put down the selective content that you really want to showcase and talk about. It's very unlikely people are going to talk about experiences outside of your resume in an interview. They're probably going to look at your interview, your resume as a base for the interview and for that discussion. So when you come to think about it, you don't want to make your resume a data dump as such. You want to be selective about what you put out there so you can fill, fulfill those two criteria about really evoking interest in your candidacy and about facilitating a strong discussion on the experiences that you want to share within an interview. So let's get into the structure of a resume. I kind of touched upon this a little earlier as well. But you're going to, and you're going to say, okay, listen, you know, Vikram, this is very, very basic. But let's just cover it. So you have a complete guideline on how to write a really strong resume. Um, so you start with the company with your name and your contact details. And yes, you want to proofread that and make sure your contact details are all correct. Then you get on to a company name, a one-line description of your employer. So for example, if you say I'm employed by McLeod Gunge and Company, and you don't really have a description of your company, it's impossible for the reader to understand what that company does. So what should that one line description of the company entail? A great way to start is just go to your company's website, look at the about a section, you see a quick summary out there, and you further go and summarize that. But essentially you want to put things in perspective. What is the size of that company? What sort of industry is it operating in? What sort of revenue does it hold? It kind of talks about the importance of your work as well in that context, right? So think about it and have a general one line description, which is pretty easy to understand for everyone. You don't want to make it too compli complicated, just keep it simple. After that, you have a designation. Usually, your data will be on the right side of the designation because you've changed multiple goals, they can see the career progression. Sometimes people have dates right next to the employment section. Sometimes they will have only two designations with dates on side, on side of each, but they don't have the relevant bullets within those designations. They just have them randomly below a company. It's impossible for someone reading a resume to really understand under which section you've achieved what. So you really want to allocate your bullets also to the particular designations as well. You want to have one to two lines per bullet, not more than that. And more importantly, you want to allocate more space to your more recent roles. So often I find that candidates misalign or misappropriate the amount of content they have for different roles. So someone who's been in consulting, maybe has only done one year of consultancy from 2019 to 2020, but has done eight or 10 projects, feels like working on each and every project in that. And they may have eight or 10 bullets out there. Whereas, but the more recent roles where they spent two years and perhaps they've had two designation changes as well. They may only highlight three or four 
skills. But you spent two years here, so essentially you've done more work here. You probably have more leadership experience here, even more in larger leadership roles. You probably create a higher impact out here because you show more career progression. So your more recent roles essentially should be more balanced. They should be taking up more content than your, your past roles, right? So you want to adjust your content accordingly as well. And those are the basic things that you want to keep in mind when constructing your resume. Now let's get on to the most critical part and the most difficult part about this. How do you write a bullet? Um, so essentially, a bullet should have only three parts. An action verb in the beginning, what you have done, and ideally it should end with a result. Not every bullet may have a result, but it's important uh, to put it there to showcase impact wherever possible. So let me give an example of an action verb. Devise strategy, formulated strategy, created strategy. So devise, formulate, created, build, those are all action verbs. Past tense, it showcases what you've done. So if you look at the example, device strategy to segment 6 million customers and target deals to the right audience is essentially what you've done. Increasing spend per customer by 52%, that is the result. And if you look at, look at that in context, it really tells an organization what you're bringing to the table, the sort of impact that you can create. And I think what you want to do is put things in perspective. So when you say, and numbers paint a picture and they really put things in perspective. When you say I have increased uh, customer spend by 52%, sometimes you may find that absolute figures work better than percentages. Sometimes you can say that I've helped increase um, a revenue from $2 million to $10 million. And that sometimes sounds huge. Sometimes if you have increased uh, or reduced something or increased the spend per customer, say from $1 to $1.52 or to $2, you may say it doesn't sound that great. When you put it as a percentage, it sounds much better, right? So you 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 take a call and see which one sounds better, and accordingly you select what content you want to put in. The important thing, thing is put things in perspective whenever you're creating a bullet. Uh, so what I mean by perspective, so I've given a couple of examples out here. When you're saying I led a 13 member cross function team to grow business from 36 million to 56 million. Great, it sounds really impressive, right? You've got 2 million additional sales. But what if you said that I've grown sales by another $20 million when industry growth was only 6%? Ask yourself which of the two sound better and more powerful. And that's what I mean by perspective. You really want to put the content in perspective, you want to put your achievements in perspective. You can say finished first in class, right? In a class of how many? In a class of 4, 8, 10, 20, 200, 1000. Very different. So you really want to put things in perspective. And that will help the reader understand the magnitude of your achievements. Okay. So coming back to bullets, I think the important part of this is that you must, especially for an MBA resume, Keep your language simple. Avoid jargon. Again, like I'm repeating, you have no idea who's going to be reading it, what their background is, whether they understand the language from the industry or not. So imagine you read a bullet like this. This is a bullet you have taken from a, a former client's resume, took ownership to implement user onboarding using HLD, LLD, unit and scrum testing. I'm not from the tech industry. I don't understand any of this. So automatically, you're not talking to me, possibly talking to yourself. You really want to simplify, right? And if you're trying to say, you can say, oh, I took ownership, but is that really the action word? Perhaps not. So you want to go back and ask yourself, what did I do? Did I own something? Did I implement something? Ask yourself that. And then go back to the previous slide that I shared and start each bullet with an action word, really simplify it. What have you done? And ideally try and end with the result. A bullet like this doesn't really showcase the result to me, especially in layperson language. So keep it simple, uh, keep it very easy. Uh, 
Now let me give you some tips for creating bullets, right? So when you want to create a bullet and you're really thinking about all these action verbs and all of that, make a list of action verbs. You can easily Google. You can write to me and you can get some action verbs from me as well. Don't worry, I'll share a list with you. And ask yourself, have I really employed any of these skills? Right? Have I planned something? Have I analyzed something? Have I identified any problems in a company? Have I led any project? Have I managed anything? Make a list of action verbs. Ask yourself, have I employed any of these? And make a list of all the skills that you have engaged. And create a data dump. Go beyond one page as possible. Because essentially, you want to sell skills. And skills which are relevant to the school. right? So start doing that. Another way to look at it is go back to your job, your job description. You probably have an offer letter from a company or an initial job, job description, and that's a great place to start. It probably tell you that, listen, your role requires you to analyze. It requires you to mentor people. It requires you to uh, manage projects. It requires you to generate new business. And then you've got a whole bunch of action verbs as well. It's a great place to start in terms of creating action verbs and creating your bullets. And that way you can understand the sort of value you can bring to the table. Right? So examples of some action verbs, led, headed, guided, all of those showcase leadership skills. If you see words like solve, resolve, you're showcasing problem solving skills. If you're showcasing words like created, develop, devise, formulated, you're showcasing creativity. If, you show, if, you, if I see bullets such as restructure, plan, I can see your planning skills. If I see analyze, identify, discover, I can see investigative skills. If I see words like collaborated, motivated, mediated, I can see your people skills. And all of this kind of showcases leadership. And this kind of showcases the sort of skills that you bring to the team. It highlights leadership qualities that you're bringing to the school and your potential for leading in the future. So you think about it and make a list of action verbs. Ask yourself, have I engaged any of these skills? Have I used any of these skills at work? If yes, sure, start a bullet with those action verbs and write the rest of it. What have I done? What is the result of that? So common mistakes that I find with content. And um, I think when you're going through this, you want to keep this at the back of your mind, right? A lot of people start with an action verb, but then some, sometimes you find that those action verbs suddenly sway away and they move away from that and suddenly the bullet starts with successfully or it starts with something else. Only person to do this. So why are you breaking away from that? Continue with that theme of action verbs. The other thing that sometimes we find that people haven't really thought through the action verbs that they use. So what do I mean by that? Sometimes people write, I coordinated efforts of so many people. Sure. But um, being a coordinator, is that a great place to be in? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Sometimes it could be sound very mundane and very menial. It may not sound like you're really bringing something very large to the table, right? It could be uh, something like selected for. Sure, or shortlisted for. So you were shortlisted, but you weren't really awarded anything. So is that really the best action work that you could have used? Nominated for. Some of the people say, oh, I, I was nominated for something. Great. And this brings me to the second point. Sometimes you think that something is selling you, but it's not really. So I was nominated for an award, but I didn't actually win. So you need to kind of think of that as well, right? And you need to put that in context as well. If it was a really large award, you need to put that in context. Yes, I was nominated amongst 3,000 people. I was among the top three or three people nominated amongst 3,000 people for an award and innovation. Great. Then you've got some context out there, right? So you want to be the judge of that. Sometimes people write, I finished in the top 25% of my class. Now, if you're applying to top B school, especially something like a Harvard, do you really think that they want someone who's finished in the top 25% and the potentially 25% of the people in their class which are better than you academically? So you really want to think about that. McKinsey, BCG, Bain, they're looking for the very creme de la creme. 
the top talent, so you can the top 25% of my class, is that really selling you? And when you're writing your content, question what you're writing. Ask yourself, is it doing more harm or is it really selling you? When we come back to the MBA uh, resume as well, a lot of common mistakes that I find is that there's a lot of stuff on your resume which easily could go in the application form. You're just wasting space in real estate. You have a GMAT score. So you say, hey, I got 710. Okay, great. It's not a brilliant score as well. Some of me about 720, 730, 740, 760. So you really need to put that in context as well. If the average school or score at the school you're applying to is relatively low and 710 is really, really high, then sure, put it in. right? But even then, if you score 760, you really need to put it in. It's there in the application form. If you're applying to a competitive school, they anyway know that you scored a high score. You can see that in the application. So don't waste that space. Another thing that I commonly see on resumes is that they've done a great job with action words, a great job of describing what they've done. But then there are no numbers. There is no result. And numbers really put a paint a picture. They really put things in perspective. So wherever possible, quantify. Wherever possible. It's not possible in every case, and I understand that. And maybe that's not everything. In every case, you may not want to showcase a result. Maybe with the other qualities and other things that you want to showcase, and that's fine. But wherever possible, put in numbers. More common mistakes. Dates overlapping. So sometimes you find someone has multiple designations within the same dates. Or they've been working multiple companies during the same time. And it gets very confusing for a reader. Which organization were you employed with? What is the value that you brought to that? So rather than creating confusion, you need to preempt all of this. And then you want to showcase and tell your story well on the resume. So if you have an overlap of dates, see how you can highlight it, how you can explain that. Another common mistake, not proofreading. And this essentially happens to people, and I find this in very often, spelling errors. Spelling errors in their... Uh, email address. Sometimes you find that people leave spaces which are numbers they want to uh, fill in later on on the resume while they're drafting it. They just leave an XXX million and they just leave it and it goes to school and suddenly you say, hey, I haven't filled this in yet. And then two, three places and it just looks like a shoddy job. You're not really paying attention to it. And that's not, it's a small thing which can really make sure that you get ding from the school. Kind of avoid that, right? Just do a proper proofread, that other proofread, get a second set of eyes on it. And um, usually this happens when you have people interview that you get carried away by, with the numbers that you put in this. You say, hey, you know what? It sounds better. Coming uh, fifth in class sounds much better than coming in the top 10, right? So you start exaggerating. And then you get carried away with and then you suddenly find that there's no way to defend those numbers. So don't exaggerate. Right? Um, whatever numbers you put on your resume, be ready to defend them, especially in an interview. When in doubt, guesstimate, but be on the more conservative side. It's better to do that than to exaggerate. So when you're constructing your bullets, initially don't give yourself so many parameters. Just write. And then at the end of it, when you're selecting and you're editing, come back to these common mistakes, look at this again and again, and ask yourself, does this make sense for me? Excuse me. So I've come pretty much to the end of the presentation and the guidelines on how to construct a really strong MBA resume. But at the end of it, do I walk you through the process of creating bullets. Let me tell you, the hardest part of this entire exercise itself is creating those bullets. It's not easy. It's not really easy to question what have I really done? Where is the value add that I've put in? What is the sort of impact that I've created? You really need to think hard about what you've done. The more important part and the more difficult part out here is again selecting what content you want to keep. Everything sounds important. So you really want to think about what's important. And I would kind of tell you as kind of a, a little bit of a rough guideline. 
that is something is being repeated. If you have the word analyze five times in your resume, yes, someone knows you bring analytics skills to the table. You don't really need that action word five times. So you can do away with it. You can replace it with something else. If you have the same result, something which is repetitive, you don't need that as well. So don't get married to your content. Ask yourself, is it selling you? Is the content that you put on your resume stuff that you want to talk about? What is the more important stuff that you want to talk about? And use that as a guideline to help you shortlist the sort of content that you want in your resume. One more thing. I also find that people spend way too much time formatting a resume rather than creating content. And why do I say this again? I say this because usually people do a Google search for templates for resume. Then you see these great websites which have all these fancy templates and they say create a resume in five minutes. And you get excited and you start typing, 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 and you're done in five minutes or ten minutes. But then you have to ask yourself how much thought you really put and you put into your resume. Um, if that's a starting point, and that's a really critical point of your application, if that's really going to make your application stand out at the very beginning, if that's the only piece of content that interviewers have of you, I've really done it justice. And this is all the more important for job essays or job uh, resumes as well. That resume is going to open up doors for you. It's going to um, it's really going to sell you. So if you're not going to do a good job of spending, give that, the resume that sort of importance and that sort of time to edit, then I think you really need to question uh, the different aspects of your application and such and what's important and what's not. And as a guideline, I think uh, another consultant had repeated this in a presentation a couple of years ago, and I'm going to read it as well. Because this was a study done by GMAT a few years ago, and they actually asked candidates what the most important, sorry, they asked these school lab admission officers what the most important aspects of the MBA application. And number one was your undergraduate GPA, and someone out here has commented on having a low GPA. And yes, it does make a difference. It, it's, it's pretty strong weightage on your CGPA, especially at certain schools. So if you have a low GPA, that may affect you. The second most important thing perhaps was the GMAT score. The third most important thing was the resume. Then came essays and recommendations and other things, right? So just something for you to think about. Sometimes people spend way too much time just editing essays and defining essays when perhaps you should have spent an equal amount of time on just getting your story right through the resume. I usually like to start with doing the resume first. We usually spend two to three weeks with our clients and just getting their resume right and constructing the story through there. We finish applications and we revisit the resume to see if your stories have been, have, uh, or your accomplishments have been captured by the resume itself and they're kind of corresponding to writing your essays and then you want to revisit the story. So I think it's an extremely important part. If any of you guys are struggling with creating bullets or figuring out what content that you want to retain in your resume. I mean, get in touch with us. We're great at doing this. We'd be happy to help you. Obviously, it's going to be for the fee. It's not going to be free. If you want to learn more about the sort of services that we provide, please visit our website, becomeshaconsulting.com. Write to me if you find uh, this presentation useful, if you find that you want a list of action verbs that you want to consider. Write to me at mba.becomeshaconsulting.com. Here are my contact details. Write to me and I'll see how I can help. If you want to inquire about any of the services that we provide as well, visit our website and uh, we'll try and help you out. Um, this has been a kind of an academic presentation. I've tried to make it interesting as possible by giving examples. I'm sorry if I've bored you, but I do hope you find this useful. Uh, I do hope this will help you create or give you the tools and the guidelines to create a really strong resume, both for a job and especially for your MBA applications. I'm really excited about the new season. I hope you are able to project your story and tell it really well and then give me some tools that will help you. Please 
write in the comments if you found this presentation useful. If you'd like to see more content such as this, what you like, what you didn't like, etc., and it'll be a good guideline. If you have any questions, feel feel free to shoot now. I'm gonna wait for a couple of minutes to see what questions there are, especially regarding the resume. Otherwise, feel free to write to me as well separately, and I'll be happy to answer those. I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes, and if there are any great com uh, comments out here, I'm going to answer those, right? Thank you so much. I'm going to switch out of the presentation and um, just await some comments. If there are. All right. So I think I've been pretty clear with this. If you have any more comments, feel free to add uh, to the comment section below. I hope you liked it. If you liked this presentation and this video, give it a thumbs up. Otherwise, write to me and give me some feedback, and I'm happy to learn from this, right? I wish you guys all the very best for the application season. I wish you all the best for your applications. Um, so yes, any comments, write to me. Otherwise, all the very best. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon from whichever part of the world you're in, and see you soon. All the best for your applicants. Thank you very much.